and there are two uh, papers going around. We just like to take attendance to see, of curiosity, who comes back and who's new because of the particular topic. Um, I'm Annette Davis in charge of the Voices of the Past program and also had some responsibilities for our tour last summer when we decided we were going to see where the settlers originally went uh, a little bit west of Grand Island and where Anna Steer Thompson had lived. And it opened a lot of questions and at the annual meeting, Judy Huston was there and said she would give a presentation about the history of Anastasia Thompson as she knew it, and evidently the word has spread because uh, we have people from, raise your hand if you're a Thompson descendant. From quite a ways away, I think. So we'll get started so you have time to visit afterwards. To Can you hear me? Do I, have to, do I have to do this? Okay, well, if I roam around and I talk off the top of my head, so if I'm away from this and you can't hear me, raise your hand, I'll talk louder. That's the solution to everything, talk louder. I want to thank um, the Hall County Historical Society for inviting me to speak today about the life of Anastasia Thompson. Uh, there are some special people here that I want to give a special thank you to. I'm going to introduce them first. They don't need to stand. I'll let you know who they are. First, there's a very special thank you that goes out today to Leah Thompson Jensen. Leah is a third generation granddaughter of John and Anna Thompson. Um, Leah, is it okay if I share how old you are? Okay, <laughs> Leah is 87 years old. She's with us today. She's accompanied by her nephew, David, and his wife, Marge. They've come to us from Lincoln. Dwayne Thompson is here. Dwayne is a descendant coming from the family, and he is visiting uh, today with us from Kansas City. Daryl. Daryl, excuse me, Daryl. Where did I get Dwayne? There's Daryl. And uh, my mom and my aunt are here, Eunice and Arlene. My daughter is in the back with my grandsons, uh, Sharon Durer, and my grandsons, Dylan and Anthony, who represent seventh generation. You'll be hearing more about some of these people during the talk as we go along today. So I want to let you know first um, the line that I come from. There, are, there were five children of Anna and John Thompson. They had one girl named Emma. Emma married John Schultz. They raised eight children to adulthood, one of them being my grandfather, August. He was the youngest boy in that family. He had two girls. They were Arlene and Eunice, and I am Judy. I am the oldest of their children. So I am fifth generation of founding family of Hall County. Before we get started on what I know to be facts and what I assume and what I don't know, because I'll tell you all of that as we go through. I want to tell you about how I came to be here today. Back in 2004, I took a cemetery tour. And a cemetery tour is a wonderful thing to go on. If you get the opportunity, I highly recommend it to people. Through the cemetery tour, you're taken into the old section of the old cemetery and there were a lot of gravestones that they were talking about the founding families. So I'm going through this tour and I raised my hand with a question and I said, well, what about Anna Steer? And they said, well, we know she was a member of the founding family. We know she's buried in the city cemetery, but we don't know much else about her. And I thought, I know stuff. I would like to get grandma's story to at least some people so that when you're on the cemetery tour, maybe you could get a little bit more information. So I went home and I put on my list of my goals and resolutions for 2005 was to try to bring a little bit of Anna Steer's history out to the community through the historical society and to get grandma's grave marked as founding family. Because I knew where the grave was. They, at that time, they didn't know where the grave was. 
So along comes 2005, and I'm going about my business, and I come to the annual meeting of the Hall County Historical Society. And I come into their meeting, they have a dinner, it's a very nice evening if you get to come, it's very, very, a, a very nice evening to come to, very good food, very good com camaraderie amongst people. And I was here about the whole sum of 15 minutes before someone found out who I was. And they approached me and said, would you like to give a talk to our voices of the past about the history of Anastir? And I go, sure. <laughs> and then 15 minutes later, I went, what did you do? Why are you not running for the door and running for the hills as fast as you can go? Because I thought about it and I thought, all of the things that I know about grandma, I could probably stand here and talk to you for about four minutes. Everything that I know factually about grandma, at that point, like I said, would take four minutes. But what I knew in my heart about grandma, I could stand here for a whole, a whole day and talk to you about that. But I thought, in the meantime, what would I impart to you? And then comes through my brain, my mom's voice. And this voice has come into my brain many a times in the past with one sentence. And she said it many a time, and that came through my, through my brain again that night. It was, you come from a line of strong women. You can do anything. So I thought, okay, I come from a line of strong women, and I can do this. So I thought, okay, I'll do it. Besides, I can talk to my mom, and I can talk to my aunt, and they'll tell me all kinds of stories. So I said, well, what do we have that belongs to Grandma Steer? And they went, nothing. And I said, well, what do we know about that? Well, we know what Grandpa told you. And so then I'm going, okay, now, research time. Through the course of this, I have been blessed by many of these family people that are sitting over there who have just called and volunteered information. We've gotten together, we've talked, we've had laughs about everything. I've learned a lot through this. So through the course of today, you're going to hear about the things that we know to be true about Grandma Steer and her trip here. I'm gonna tell you about a few of the assumptions that I've made about her trip and some of the things that I assume to be about her life. And then there'll be a lot of things that I just simply don't know about. And I'll tell you, I don't know about them. So I'm going to go ahead and get started today with my little story that says, Once upon a time, in Littenberg, the town, in the province of Holstein, in the community of the ununified states of Germany, there was born a girl on April 27th of 1833. Her name was Anna. What her middle name is, I do not know. What her parents' names were, I do not know, and here comes a train. So, <laughs> all I do know is, is that she had one older brother. His name was William, and he was born on September 20th of 1831. Sometime during her childhood, Anna's parents died, and she was raised by an uncle. When she was 18 years old, her brother left to go to America. He would write to Anna, I assume, because she knew where he was, and tell her what he was doing in America. He was on a, um, he was a fireman on a river steamer that would go up and down the Mississippi and put out barge fires. While he was in the United States, he had married. Anna remained in Germany, and she was engaged to a young man named John Thompson. My grandpa, who August Schultz, used to tell me that grandpa was a butcher and that he lived in the approximately the same area as where Anna Steer lived. During the times of the 1850s, Germany had a lot of problems. The country was trying to fight amongst its own little provinces um, because they weren't unified. Over there at that time, you had a country, you had Austria, you had Prussia, you had Germany trying to establish its borders but it wasn't a unified com country at that time. So there were a lot of wars going on and a lot of uneasiness and provinces were taken over and provinces were given back. So this was all going on in Grandma's time over there. 
What prompted her to decide to come to America, I don't know. But one day, in the spring of 1857, Anna Steer got on a boat in Kiel, Germany, and she set sail to America. There were other people from her community on that same boat, but Anna again by herself, leaving John Thompson in Germany and coming here. They sailed up the Mississippi River and she landed in Davenport, Iowa, and that's where she was met by her brother and his wife. Now first I'd like to share with you a little bit about what's going on in America when Grandma arrives. She came to the country, she came from conflict to a country that also was in conflict. At the time there were 31 states in the Union. Several of these states were free states and several of these states were slave states. And during the presidency of Andrew Jackson, he had made a decree that all of the, and I'm gonna use the word Indian for the purpose of this speech, that he had declared that all Indians needed to live on the west side of the Mississippi River. So they were all displaced to the west side of the Mississippi. As civilizations expanded west, the Indians were pushed further west and they ended up being displaced to the west side of the Missouri River. Now the Kansas-Nebraska Territory was surrounded by states. There were states to the south, states to the east, and states to the west. What amazed me was California and Oregon were already states of the Union and we were the Wild West out here in the middle. This was a developed, undeveloped territory and it was open wilderness. It had been surveyed back in 1817 and it had been deemed to have some fertile land but most of it was wasteland. So it wasn't really that good for farming. It was also the place where all of the Indians had been squished into. There was a lot of wildlife out here. We all know there was a lot of buffalo. There were also elk. There were also antelope. There were also many Indian tribes. There was a lot of grassland and some uh, small wildlife. The primary Indian tribe that lived around here we know is the Pawnee. There were also frequent visits by the Sioux and there were six other uh, tribes that also came through the area kind of sort of on a regular basis. And to me, I often wondered if Grandma knew what she was getting into when she headed out because coming from a community in Germany, um, going out into the wilderness, not knowing anything, being in a strange country, and I'm gonna assume, not speaking English, that I've wondered what's going through her mind and I guess I can only guess what was going through her mind at that time, but being a brave woman, she's going out there and tackle it. The reason that they formed the organization, and I know a lot of you know a lot about the history of Hull County because of the Davenport Company that was founded to bring settlers to the, this community, was because there was the idea that after or because of the conflicts with the slave states and the free states that they were gonna have to relocate Washington DC and what better place to relocate it but in the center of the country and why not have some established communities out here in the center of the country where they could um, be ready to accept this honor of being the capital of the United States. So there were several people in this Davenport company who said we'll just put up flyers all over, we'll see who responds to our flyers and we'll pay. If they don't have any money, we'll pay to uh, give them provisions and we'll send them out there into the wilderness and we'll give them 320 acres of land as long as they agree that of the 320, as soon as they get title to it, they give 160 back to the, com the company so that they can use it to form the town, which eventually would be the capital of the United States. So it was all great idea at the time they would get these people, they'd have the flyers up, they would get all these people together, they'd truck them all off, or not truck them all off, but have them journey off into the wilderness, and um, they would provide provisions for them, and people could repay for the provisions at the time when they were able to within a year. The grandma's brother had a job in Davenport. Why he would want to leave that job, I don't know. Why grandma could have got a job there, why she didn't stay there, I don't know. 
I'm, what I think is that here is this enticement that you can own land. You can go out and you can establish and you can develop and you can be a landowner. And that's my assumption, is the reason that they started out. So they agree that they are going to be part of the group that heads off to uh, this territory. When they left Davenport, Iowa on March 28th of 1857, there were five wagons, there were 16 yoke of oxen, and some dogs. There were 25 men, five of them were married, they had wives. There was one child and there was grandma, who is affectionately known in all of the history stuff as the one single white woman. And they were the people who trucked across Iowa in their little covered wagon train. They made 23 miles a day. They got up at four o'clock in the morning so they could be on the road at six o'clock in the morning. They would try and make 23 miles in a day. When they would stop, the women would cook. The men would have to scout for water along the way so that there would be water for when they did stop so that they would have water. They would also probably try and bring a few little wildlife in for food so that those could be cooked and prepared for that time. But it took them 23 days for this wagon train to get across Iowa. Now the wagons were heavily loaded down with all of their provisions, so most of the people had to walk. So grandma walked 23 days across the state of Iowa. Now you can drive across the state of Iowa in a, couple, in a few hours, and it's a long drive to get across the state of Iowa. And when I do it, I think back to the time when they had to walk across the state of Iowa. But in 23 days, they got to Omaha, and they spent one day in Omaha resting because their supplies then had come up the Missouri, the supplies for the community were to meet them in Omaha, and then they would head off to this area. So there are five wagons, their extra supplies for establishing the community, um, the oxen that they had, all of those set off from Omaha coming west. They passed Fremont, which was a really big booming town of 10 houses. Then they got to Columbus, which had 18 houses. And that was about it for when they ran into settled settlements. So they were coming along down the river and they got to this community of Hall County and they stopped here on July 2nd of 57 and they surveyed this area, looked around, people went out in different directions thinking, is this a good place or is this not? Should we go further? Where should we do? Um, one of the things that my mom always told me that my grandpa said was is that they had actually considered going a little further west, but they'd met some Mormons coming back along the trail who said, don't go that way, it's a desert out there. So they ended up staying right where they were. And that is now the settlement of Hall County. At the time, Grandma was 24 years old. I know she spoke German. How much English she spoke, I don't know. But you would think somewhere along the way she probably had to learn how to pick up some English. Her role was to be the cook, to take care of the laundry, to set up the meals, to clean up the meals. The parties had decided that they were going to build four houses that first summer when they got here. Each of these houses would have two rooms in them, approximately 14 by 14. So they would have eight rooms. Five married couples um, could occupy five of the rooms. I'm going to assume Anna stayed in a room with her brother. And the single men all had to share the other three. But they all chose their roles in what they had to do. They had to um, some of the men had to prepare making the, the buildings. Some of the men had to break up the land. Some of the men had to go back to Omaha to get more rations or more supplies because they constantly, you can't just run down to the quick shop and pick anything up. So they had to go back to Omaha and get things. So when they knew how long is it going to take for this first trip to go back and forth, they decided that they would um, ration out things. So. Where I've got a thing I want to show you right now. Uh, 
The original settlement where they first stopped is located around where the family farm is right now, where Ray Evans lives. And I, all of you had said, or Annette had mentioned before about the trip, about going out to the house. Ray lives on the current property from Anastere, and Ray has been very gracious in allowing us to come out there, walk around. I think Ray's a, he's an adoptive member of our family because he loves our history as much as we do. Actually, um, there are things that when he'll say something and I'll go, I didn't know that. So, but anyway, um, when you are out on the family area, it's a really long drive into, to get into the, where the housing site is. The settlements and everything where they originally stopped were closer to the roads, closer to the uh, way up front part of it. Everybody had to um, play their role, and I can only assume that when Grandma was out here in the wild or in the wilderness, with limited rations, her fiancé was back in Germany, Grandma came with what she had on her back, very few clothes, and here she was out here in a community trying to establish an area of which to live. Now, when you go out to the, found, the place now, you will see um, light wires and that, but you do see, going up Ray's long driveway, you see an open um, pasture area out there. And to me, if you think about it in your mind's eye, that's what the whole place looked like. Undeveloped, mines, nothing out there, um, and the Pawnee Indians, according to my grandpa, living in the thicket not too long away. During the time that the settlers were out here, um, the military was over at Fort Kearney, and the military would come through because they ha were in charge of keeping Indian uprisings to a minimum because the Indians didn't get along with each other very well. And as the settlers came in and were intrusive on the uh, Pawnee lands, uh, even though the Pawnee were a friendly people, they were still a little agitated that people were taking away their lands. So Grandma again is out here uh, with uncertainty as to what's going to become of this community. They, Manisha had to be out here to tone down these clashes that were going on. And sometime during the fall of 1857 or the spring of 1859, Grandma had to go to Fort Kearney. As Leah says, it's out of necessity. The military told Grandma, it's not safe for you out here. You're a single white woman. You don't have a man to take care of you. And it was commonly known that the Indians would um, kidnap and would take children. So they didn't feel that it was safe for Anna to be out here by herself. Now, I'm going to make an assumption that Grandma went there in, eight, nine, in 1858. And I'll explain the reason why I'm making this assumption. Um, you're going to hear some stories about Grandma being over in Fort Kearney because she was a nanny to the captain. And when there will be a few more people up here explaining some of the things that we have on display, I'll be sharing this stage with them. They're going to give you a few more little stories about that in a moment. So in 1858, it was the first year that there could be crops because the farmers had come in the middle or the pioneers had come in the middle of 1857. So this, 1858 was the first year you could have crops out here. They had broken approximately 50 acres of land. They could put in crops. They were working on their housings. And they had, being the diligent people that they were, they had made contract with the military to provide grain to Fort Kearney. Now at the time, Fort Kearney was getting their grains from Missouri, the state of Missouri. And they were paying approximately three and a half to four dollars a bushel to get their grain brought in. So the settlers said to them, well, we can do it. We'll charge $2 a bushel and get the grain to you. So that was a very, very favorable deal for both parties. And all they had to do with then was to deliver on that contract that they had made. It was in the spring of 1858 when William Steer and his wife had a baby. Her name was Nellie, and she was born on March 3rd of 1858. So if I deduce right, that makes Grandma an aunt. 
Also in the January of 1858, there was a prairie fire and the fire had destroyed the homes of William Steer and Henry Shale. So they had lost their housing. Uh, at that time, William Thompson's wife would have been approximately seven months pregnant. And with the help of the community, they had rebuilt and survived through this. This is when I made the assumption that Grandma would have gone to Fort Kearney. She was an aunt. The household that she was living in uh, was expanding. Again, strife between the um, Indians that was going on was, um, would reach higher levels of aggravation than at other times. So that my assumption was is that's when Grandma went to Fort Kearney. Um, At the time that she would have gone to Fort Kearney, there were still several of the original people here, of the original family, and in July 5th of 1858, another party had come from Davenport. They brought 20 people with them. They brought 10 teams of horses, 20 yokes of oxen, and they brought cows this time, and a few chickens. So this is the first time that there was this kind of livestock into the settlement. It was the first year of their growing season, the settlers had had a long winter. They had rationed their supplies because they had had to figure out how to live between the times that people could get those wagons back and forth to Omaha. The financial crisis of that time frame had also bankrupt the Davenport Company, so the Davenport Company didn't have any money to send them supplies with anymore. So here sits our little band of survivors out here in the Midwest. They're the company had invested approximately $6,000 in them to bring them out here. Uh, they didn't ask the settlers to give the money back, which was a good thing. But it left them out here all by themselves to try and figure out how were they going to set up this community and how were they going to deal with um, building things because they were, no money was going to come to them, so they were going to have to figure out where they were going to get that income from. And they were going to have to figure out how they were going to work out arrangements with the Pawnee Indians. So in 1859, the settlers also had a good year. But this was the time that gold was uh, discovered out in Pikes Peak in Colorado. And there were a lot of people coming along the trail. Now, Grandma's house, and I should have a marker up here, but I don't. Grandma's house is on the Oregon Trail. When you go through or the property is anyway, when you're coming down the Oregon Trail, it can come in several different ways. So now I'm going to step away from here, so hopefully you can hear me. But the Oregon Trail is coming through, and it's coming south of these. Thank you. It's coming through here. And when this would get high with water, sometimes people would have to route around and go this way. This was right on the trail where there was a lot of traffic going, coming and going. At this time, Grandma wasn't living here. This was just part of the original settlement area. But Grandma liked this area, and you're going to hear why in a little bit. Um, in 18, in um, September, or no, January of 1859, there was a large fire because a lot of the prospectors didn't like the German people. And so the fire destroyed eight of the houses that had already been established in the community. So again, here was the community trying to rebuild again, which they did. One of the things that I found through my reading was, and my daughter said, Mom, you better check this out. You think these prices are right? But they were. I checked them out in a couple of different areas. They could sell a watermelon for a dollar to the travelers on the trail. They could sell a head of cabbage for 50 cents to the travelers on the trail. Also on the trail, as it came through, when people passed away, they were buried along the trail. On the property where Ray now lives, there are four unmarked graves. Two of them we know to be people who are from the Mormon trail travelings, and the other two I don't know anything about. But Grandma at this time was over in Fort Kearney, and there were establishing a, straight, uh, a stagecoach line that was coming through because we were getting developments out here. And the stagecoach line was coming through, and mail was coming through one time a week. 
So it was easier then for Grandma to get a letter back to Germany and tell John Thompson where she was. So they made arrangements that he would come, and he left in 1850.